Um, hello, everyone. Thanks very much for attending this session. It's great to see so many people here. Uh, the topic for our session today is Postgres schema migrations using something called the expand contract pattern. So my name is Andrew Farries. Um, I'm a software engineer at Zeta. We're a serverless Postgres platform. Um, and I've spent part of the last year thinking about schema changes, schema migrations, and why uh, application teams uh, often struggle with schema changes and how we can make schema migrations easier for our users. So the outline for the talk then is to first cover some of the common pitfalls that application development teams fall into when they're applying schema changes to production systems. Then have a look at some of the tools and techniques that people use to do this today. And then in the second half of the talk, we'll look in more detail at a particular pattern called the expand contract pattern that uh, teams use to do schema migrations. And then finally, we'll look at a new open source tool that we built at Zeta called PG Roll that aims to simplify the expand contract pattern for schema migrations. But first, a brief question. So as you can maybe tell from my accent, I come from the UK, from England, and I've spent uh, quite a lot of time in London. I was also recently in Manhattan in New York, and I was struck by the difference in street layouts between Manhattan and New York. So London is a city that's just grown organically over many hundreds of years without much forethought put into the street layout, uh, city planning. It's just grown organically with new bits of the city grafted on over time. Compare that with Manhattan with its orderly grid layout of streets. It's therefore much easier and simpler to navigate your way around Manhattan than it is to find your way around London. And I think there's an analogy to be made here with um, schema, database schema too. So I'm sure we've all onboarded onto production database systems that look like the one on the left. Whereas what we all want to work with are a nice, clean, well-designed database schema like the one on the right. But why are there so few out there? Why are there so many more London-style database schema versus compared to New York-style schema? And what is it about how database schema evolve over time that leads to these kinds of systems? So part of the answer, I think, is well expressed by Bob Martin in his book, Clean Architecture, where he says that database schemas are notoriously volatile, extremely concrete, and highly depended on. And this is one reason why the interface between applications and databases is so difficult to manage and why schema updates are generally painful. And I think the part highlighted in pink here is the key part, and we can take it one bit at a time. So first, database schema are notoriously volatile. Very few database schema are fixed forever at the time of their initial creation. They're always undergoing change. Applications need to change constantly in response to new user requirements, and the same is true of the database schemas that support them. Secondly, database schema are extremely concrete dependencies for applications. This means that there's often little or no abstraction layer between the applications and the database schema that they consume. You might have a system of views in place to offer some level of abstraction between the two, but often you don't even have that. You often have applications depending directly on the database tables in the database schema. And lastly, they're highly dependent on. So databases are at the very heart of modern software systems, whether that's a microservice architecture with um, a database per schema, or a monolithic application with one database for the whole system. They're a central part of the application, and making a change there always feels really risky. So let's start then and look at some of the common pitfalls associated with applying schema changes to production. So hopefully many people in this room will recognize some or all of these pitfalls. The first pitfall is making only additive schema changes and the associated schema debt that builds up over time as you do that. So the motivation for this one is straightforward to understand. Recall the previous slide where we said that um, 
database schema are concrete dependencies for applications. Whenever we make a change to a database schema, it has immediate knock-on consequences for the dependent applications. It's understandable, therefore, that teams want to minimize the amount of change that they do in the database schema. And one way to do this is to only ever add new bits to your database schema and leave the old bits that are already depended on untouched. This minimizes the risk of downstream client breakage, but it has costs that build up over time. Your database schema becomes uh, much harder to understand and much more difficult for new developers to onboard onto. It also has costs in terms of application code where you might end up with long-lived compatibility hacks in order to ensure forward and backward compatibility between each schema version. And it can also have real performance impacts too. As your database schema uh, gains more and more unused cruft inside, you may also accumulate unused indexes to support queries that are no longer made by the applications. And this can then start to slow down the right performance of your apps. So doing this is a surefire way to end up with a kind of London-style database schema. The next pitfall is the locking minefield. So Postgres commands, or Postgres has um, different types of locks to control concurrent access to data. And different Postgres commands will automatically take locks of the appropriate type. DDL commands, i.e. those that actually modify your schema, typically require access exclusive locks on the tables that they're modifying. Access exclusive locks are the most prohibitive, restrictive kind of lock, and they conflict with all other lock types in Postgres. So this means if you have a long running DDL operation, they can lock out reads and writes from your table, causing application downtime. Worse still, the way that Postgres commands queue for locks mean that if you're unlucky and you have a long running DML operation that starts just before your schema change happens, your schema change DDL can then queue up behind that long running DML and then further DML operations are then queued behind that DDL statement. So even if your DDL, when it runs, is only going to hold a lock for a very short time, you can still end up with reads and writes locked out of your table. There are lots of tried and trusted techniques for avoiding long-lived locks during migrations. For example, concurrent index creation, splitting the addition of constraints into two steps by adding them as not valid first and validating later. But these kind of tips and tricks, you kind of only really need, you know you need them after you've been burned. So how to navigate the locking minefield is a lesson that people, teams, often only learn the hard way. So the third pitfall are migrations that work in development and staging environments, but then fail when applied to production environments. When you're working against a very small or limited set of data or an empty database, writing migrations is actually quite an easy thing to do. But then that migration script that might run just fine against your development or staging environment may then fail against a production system. And it might fail due to um, the greater range of data in the production system, or it might be a failure to take account of some of the locking minefield issues that we mentioned a moment ago in a real production system with much more contention for locks. This problem is particularly bad in development systems where we have only a very small subset of data. And provisioning real, realistic data for test environments is a, uh, often a big challenge for a couple of reasons. One, the sheer size of production systems might make it hard to provision data for testing environments. And secondly, data protection regulations uh, often prohibit simply copying data from production systems into lower environments for testing. So vendors often produce uh, data masking, subsetting, and cloning tools to make provisioning test, uh, data for tests easier. But in my experience, in most organizations, um, the problem of provisioning realistic data environments for testing migrations is a problem that just isn't very well addressed at all. So our final pitfall is the problem of rolling back schema changes. 
So the only thing more daunting than having to make a schema change in production is having to roll back a schema change in production. And rolling back migrations can be challenging, firstly because of the uh, concrete dependency issue that we mentioned earlier. Schema changes and application changes have to be done in sync. So if you need to roll back a schema change, that often necessitates a rollback on the, on the application side as well. Some, some migrations are simply hard or impossible to roll back. For example, obvious ones like dropping a column, but some uh, data transformations might be very difficult uh, or impossible to reverse as well. Teams often prefer never to roll back and will always choose to roll forward with another migration. How many people here have worked on teams where you see uh, untested down migration scripts or teams that just don't bother writing them at all? Often the need to uh, roll back migrations is a kind of incident response level kind of thing rather than a routine part of the migration process that gets uh, tested frequently. Okay, so we've seen some of the pitfalls that teams can fall into when they're applying schema changes. So let's look now at some of the, um, the techniques, the tools and techniques that people use to apply migrations to production. So the first technique, and it's a very common one, is just to have a directory full of version-controlled SQL scripts. The state of your database is then just defined to be the projection of those SQL scripts applied in order to the database. The migration state of the database is then stored uh, in the database itself in a table that the migration tool reserves for its own use. Lots of tools work this way, like some of the leading migration tools around at the moment, like Flyway and Liquibase, as well as smaller language and framework-specific tools like Go Migrate, for example. The advantage of this approach is that it's uh, straightforward, it's simple, and it's easily inspectable. You can always have a look at what uh, migration, the migration state of your database by looking at the database itself. The disadvantage of this approach is that migrations have to be written by hand by migration authors in SQL every time. So this means things like um, using the techniques to avoid the locking minefield we mentioned earlier have to be implemented by hand every, for every migration. Uh, and if you want to use any more advanced techniques like expand contract, then um, that also has to be written by hand by the migration authors. So we can't talk about migrations without talking about object relation mappers or ORMs. Um, the subject of ORMs and whether they're a good thing or a bad thing and whether you should use them has kind of been done to death and we don't need to like, rehearse those arguments here again. But basically the advantage of using an ORM is that um, it frees application developers from having to worry about the SQL layer. They can delegate that part to a tool and concentrate just on the application layer. So with an ORM system, um, the database schema is inferred from a set of uh, data model objects in the application code itself, and the ORM tool turns that into a, a relational database schema. And schema changes with an ORM are then done in a similarly code-first way. You change the application models, and the ORM tool then infers what the correct migration is to uh, migrate the schema to that state. The big disadvantage of ORMs is the lack of control that people have over the generated SQL. So you may start to see bottlenecks in automatically generated and poorly understood SQL code. Um, but the advantage is that it frees engineers from having to, that may, may be less familiar with SQL, from having to work with SQL directly. Please, please, speak a little bit closer to the microphone. Sure, thank you. Okay, so we've talked a little bit um, about some of the tools, um, some of the pitfalls that migrate teams often fall into with migrations and some of the uh, ways in which they get applied to production systems. So let's narrow our focus now and look in more detail at specific tools and specific techniques that people use uh, to do migrations. And we'll look first at one specific uh, technique called the expand contract pattern. So the expand contract pattern is actually a software refactoring pattern 
that says if we have some kind of interface, that could be like a, a C sharp or a Java interface, or an interface in a more abstract sense, like um, an API contract or a database schema, and we want to make a change to that interface here, the bit we want to change is highlighted in red. Expand contract says that rather than make that change to the interface and update our clients all in one go, we should instead break that change down into two steps. We first expand the interface with some new functionality here in green. Then we add new clients that consume that functionality. Once we don't need the V1 clients anymore, we can contract the interface so that we are uh, left with just our uh, desired end state. So every interface change is broken down into two steps. We first expand the interface to add new functionality and then contract to remove the old. So this, is, uh, this allows interface change without breaking dependent applications. Expand contract isn't a new or particularly exciting idea. It was first documented in 2007 as a software refactoring pattern, and people are using it today um, to apply schema changes too. So we can have a look at a specific example of how expand contract is used to do schema changes. So suppose we have a table with an order, uh, a database with an orders table. It has uh, an ID, a customer ID, billing address, and a Boolean valued shipped field. After some time in production, we realized that this Boolean valued shipped field is uh, too restrictive. What we actually want is an enum uh, field called order status or status instead that tracks all of the different states an order can move through from pending, shipped, delivered, or canceled. How can we perform this schema change to a production system? So our first option is the simplest and most direct one. We can do the change in a kind of big bang migration where we first stop all of the old instances of our application and then we do the schema migration. We add the new column and we backfill it with data uh, from the previous Boolean valued column. Uh, and then we remove the old field. And once we've done that, we can roll out the next version of our application, and that can just use the new enum valued field. This is a simple approach, but it has one obvious disadvantage, which is application downtime. During the time where we're applying this migration, we have no instances of our application in production able to serve traffic at all. So if we want to do a, uh, like a zero downtime version of this migration, um, we can instead employ the expand contract pattern to do it. So the first step is we add the new enum valued status field, but we don't yet fill it with any data. We just create the new field. Next, we roll out a new version of our application. We can call it v2. And this still reads from the old field, but it does what we call a dual write. Every time it needs to write an order status, it writes to both the old field and the new field. Crucially, doing it like this allows application v1 and v2 to run alongside each other at the same time. As far as v1 of the app is concerned, there are no schema changes here to worry about. It can just carry on as before. At this point, we have to wait for the rollout of v2 to complete um, and make sure we have no v1 instances of our application running anywhere. For back-end applications where you have control over the lifetime of the services, this might be quite easy and quick to do. In a situation like a mobile app or a desktop app, you don't really have control over when the um, applications start and stop, so you might have to stay in this expanded phase for some time um, to, in order to be sure that you have no more v1 applications writing exclusively to the old field anymore. Once we know this, we can run a migration to do a data migration, a data backfill from the old uh, shipped field to the new status field. It's safe to do because there's nothing that's just writing exclusively to that Boolean field anymore. So now we're almost done and we can write the, we can roll out the new final version of the application. This one cuts reads over to use the new field and it stops doing the dual write. It just writes to the new field. So now we're at our desired end state where we have versions of our application in production that are just using the new field, no longer require the old one. Again, we have to wait for the old v2 instances to stop running so that we can be sure there's nothing using the old shipped field. 
And at that point, we can run another schema migration to remove the shipped field. So the end state is we have our desired application just using that new um, enum valued field. And there's nothing um, using that's attempting to use the old one. So this approach is obviously much more complicated than the simple Big Bang migration. It's more complicated in a few ways. Firstly, we had to run extra migrations to get this to work. Firstly, we had to add the new field as a separate independent migration. Then we had to run another migration to do a data backfill from the old to the new field. And finally, we had to remove the old field. So that was three migrations versus just one with the Big Bang approach. But also, and arguably worse than that, we had to split the migration across both the database layer and the application layer. We had to roll out this intermediate version of the application, which we didn't really care about. It was just there to support the migration that did this dual write to the old and the new fields. And only once that was complete were we able to deploy the actual final version of our application. So this is undeniably more complicated than doing a Big Bang migration. But what we get from this is a zero downtime change. So um, there, were there was no application downtime at any point, and we didn't lose any data. So we've seen that the expand contract pattern is a powerful technique for doing schema changes, but it's complicated. So we can look next at a specific tool um, called PG Roll that we put together at Zeta. Um, it's an open source uh, migration tool for Postgres that aims to do zero downtime reversible schema migrations for Postgres. So we can talk first about what some of the design goals were for PG Roll um, and what makes it different from other migration tools. And then we can do, uh, have a look at a short demo that shows some of its features in practice. So first of all, the design goal, first and foremost, was to build a migration tool around the expand contract pattern. So we've seen that the expand contract pattern is a powerful tool that um, supports doing zero downtime schema changes, but that it's hard to use. It's, it's complicated uh, in, a, in a few ways. We had those extra migrations, and we had to split the, uh, the migration between the application and database layers. So we asked ourselves, what would a migration tool that was built around the expand contract pattern at its heart look like? What if every migration operation was automatically expand contract without migration authors having to do anything themselves? Our second goal was to keep migration logic out of the application layer as much as possible. So we saw with um, expand contract, we have this dual right that we have to put in the application layer. We wanted to see if we could move that down into the database layer as much as possible, and that we think this would uh, greatly simplify most implementations of expand contract migrations. The third goal was to make migration rollbacks a lot easier, um, and this is something you kind of get for free with expand contract migrations, because during the expand phase, you only ever create new bits of schema to support new versions of the application. Rolling back becomes easier. You can simply remove those bits that you just added to support the new versions, and the old versions of your applications are unaware of any change. This makes it much easier and safer to simply roll, a back, roll back a migration during the expand phase and just have another go and try again. Next, we wanted to have no nasty surprises around locking behavior. So we talked earlier about the locking minefield and the, the well-known techniques for avoiding it. Um, but again, this is something that migration authors have to be aware of uh, when they write migrations by hand in SQL. We wanted to take that kind of Postgres operator-specific knowledge and build it into the tool itself so that all migration authors can benefit from these techniques without having to be uh, aware of them or implement them themselves. Next, we knew this was going to be a Postgres-only tool from the outset. Uh, other migration tools out there like Flyway and Liquibase support multiple database engines. Um, and this is great in that you can leverage your knowledge of those tools across whatever engines you're working with. 
But what you lose with that approach is the ability to go very deep or very specific into one particular engine and take advantage of features that might be there to support uh, zero downtime migrations. And lastly, this was going to be an open source tool from the outset. Um, so it's available on GitHub under the Apache license, and uh, we're very keen for uh, external contributions as well. OK, uh, we can jump into a quick demo that just shows a simple example of how the tool works. Um, so I really admire the people I've seen this week who can do live demos on a stage in front of a room full of people. But um, I don't think I can do that. So we're all going to watch a video together uh, instead. So to help uh, show PG Roll and how it works, uh, we put together a really simple example application. So it's a straightforward two-tier web app with a front-end application connected to an API that's talking to a Postgres data store. And what we're going to do is roll out a v2 version of the application. And we'll see how PG Roll helps um, make that application rollout much easier, even though v2 makes incompatible changes to the um, Postgres schema. So the application itself is very straightforward. It's just a to-do list application. We can add new items into the list, and we can give each one an assignee. At the database schema level, it's also as, as straightforward as you'd expect, with just all of the items being stored in one table, um, with those four fields name, whether it's done or not, and an assignee. And the schema is also as simple as you'd expect. Uh, with just those four fields and a primary key on the ID field. What we want to do now is add an, um, what we want to do now is roll out a version two of our application that adds a new constraint. The only assignees that are allowed are either Alice or Bob. No one else is allowed. So from a database perspective, this is a straightforward change to make. We just need to add a check constraint to the assignee field but it's already quite a difficult change to roll out in a zero downtime way. As we've seen, we already have V1 instances of our application in production, and if we were to apply this migration in a straightforward, naive way and add the constraint to the column, we would break those instances. Um, those V1 instances know nothing of this constraint. They allow arbitrary assignees. Those data inserts would then fail at the database layer, and users would see errors in the application. So what we want here is a way to roll out this change in such a way that we can allow v1 instances of our application to still keep running while we're rolling out v2. And we can have a look at the migration that's going to help us do this. So the first thing to notice is that PG role migrations are expressed as uh, JSON objects. So by expressing migrations at a higher level than raw SQL, we allow the migration tool to have uh, complete control over the precise sequence of operations required to implement the migration. Yeah. Uh, I can't zoom in. Uh, I don't think I can zoom in. Maybe. Uh, I think this is a bit as big as it's going to get. Um, unless anyone knows how to zoom in. Yeah, I can show that in more detail afterwards if you're interested. Um, so, um, yeah, so by, by expressing migrations outside at a higher level than raw SQL, we allow the tool to control the sequence of operations required. This means that in particular, you can, the tool can do the operations, the right operations, to ensure that we don't hold exclusive locks uh, for longer than we need to. The migration itself is pretty simple. Um, we're going to change the assignee field on the items table, and we're going to add this constraint, as we mentioned before. We also have these two up and down embedded SQL expressions in the migration, and we'll talk a little bit later about what they're for. For now, we can start the migration. So all migrations are split into two phases. There's the start phase, which corresponds to the expand phase of the expand contract pattern. So we can start the migration and roll out the v2 version of the application. 
So this is uh, just the same as V1, except the application now enforces this extra constraint. Also notice that in the V1 instance of the app, we added an assignee that's now invalid for the V2 versions. But V2 still sees that same item, but it just has a different assignee. So we can already see that V1 and V2 have slightly different views of the same data in the underlying table. We can add new version, new items into the list through V2. And because they're connected to the same data store, those changes are reflected in V1. But we can also add new items into V1. So had we applied the constraint, applied the migration directly and added the constraints, we would have broken V1 at this point. But we can still add new entries into V1. And V2, again, just has a slightly different view of that same item. So we've been able to create a new uh, kind of virtual schema to support V1 during the rollout of V2, even though V1 was not designed to work with this uh, extra constraint. If we go back to the schema, we can have a look and see what actually happened when we started the migration. So we created uh, a new field when the migration started called new assignee. And we can see that it had just um, it has almost the same data, but any data that didn't meet the constraint has been rewritten. So when the migration started, we backfilled the data from the old field into the new. And any values that didn't meet the constraints were rewritten using the up SQL that the user specified in the migration. In terms of the schema for the table, we can see we have this new assignee field. And the constraint was actually added to this new field rather than the existing one. We also have these two triggers in place that were added during migration start. And we can return to what they do in just a moment. In addition to expanding the table at migration start, we also created two uh, new schema in the database. So these are what we call version schema. And each one of these, there are two of them, one for each version of the database, V1 and V2. And each one of these version schema contains a view on the underlying table. If we have a look at the view in the first version schema for V1, it's just a straightforward one-to-one -one projection of the fields in the underlying table. If we look at the same view in the second version schema, it's almost the same. But now the um, assignee field is projecting the new assignee field from the underlying table. So this is how we're able to give each um, version of the application a slightly different view of the same schema. So when applications connect to the database, they choose which version they want to talk to by setting the Postgres search path parameter. And this allows them to talk to the version of the database schema that they expect to see. And it's how we can support two different versions of the application running at the same time. OK, we mentioned these two triggers that we also installed at migration start. Um, and they are used. Um, we mentioned we wanted to move the, um, the dual write down from the application layer and push it into the, applic and put it, push it into the database layer. So every time a value is inserted into the old version of the schema, we use the up trigger to do a data migration and copy that value over into the new field. And again, we use the user supplied up SQL expression to do that. The down trigger does the same thing in the other direction. Whenever data is written into a, from a V2 instance of the application, the down trigger copies that from the new field into the old one. Here, there's no data transformation required because it's the new field that has the constraints. So we can always just copy straight over into the old one. OK, at some point, our rollout of the V2 applications will be complete. And we'll have no more V1 instances in production anywhere. At this point, it's safe to complete the migration. So this is the second final step. Completing the migration corresponds to the contract phase of the expand contract pattern. And it shrinks the schema back down to what you'd expect the final state to be. So we've got rid of that temporary new column. We're just left with the assignee field. 
and the constraint is now applied to that assignee field directly, as you'd expect. So at this point, any V1 instances of our application will no longer run because we've removed the virtual schema, the views that support it, and we're left with just V2 instances in production. So hopefully this example, even though it's very simple, gives the basic idea of how we can use uh, multiple schema versions and triggers to move the dual right down into the database layer to support different versions of an application during a rollout um, and make the expand contract pattern much simpler and part of the migration tool itself. Okay, so having spent some time writing a migration tool, um, we feel like we've learned a few things about the state of migration tools today and some directions for the future. The first lesson was that expand contract is a powerful, powerful tool for doing schema changes, but it's difficult to manage manually um, and puts a lot of burden on the migration authors. And we think that tools can help here to make expand contract patterns simpler, easier to use, and therefore more widely applicable to a greater range of different migrations. <coughs> Secondly, migration tools should operate at a higher level than raw SQL. So whether you're specifying migrations as with JSON documents or YAML or some other custom DSL, it doesn't really matter. The key idea is that migration tools by operating at a higher level can have finer grained control over the sequence of operations to perform the migration, which means they can do things like uh, be careful about uh, lock durations, things that would otherwise be uh, a burden on migration authors. Third, migrations are long-lived processes, and migration tools should manage that process end-to-end. -end. A schema migration can take anything from less than a second to days, depending on the amount of data involved, and a migration tool should manage that process from start to finish. So we've seen that um, in a PG role migration, it's split into two phases. You can start the migration to expand your schema, and you can stay in that state for as long as you need to, and the migration tool is handling the ongoing migration data transformation as long as that migration is active for. And lastly, we, uh, data migrations should be kept out of the application layer as much as possible and handled at the database layer by migration tools. This simplifies and removes the need for doing dual writes in the application layer and um, pushes it down to the database layer under the control of a migration tool. Thanks very much for listening to the talk. Um, please leave feedback with this QR code. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Also, my colleagues from Zeta as well in the gray t-shirts, also happy to talk to you about schema migrations too. Thank you. We have five minutes for questions. I'll start. Who was first? <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm interested in the backfill phase. Uh, how In there, you showed us the expand and the contract. How does the backfill work, and can you batch it up into, like if you have to update 10 billion rows, yeah. how do you do that in batches so that you don't lock every row in the table? Yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, it's exactly as you say. If you have a, a many, many rows to backfill, Obviously, you, you can't do it in one batch, otherwise you'll take row locks on the entire, every row in the table. So backfills are done in configurable batches. I think you would default to something like 1,000 rows per batch so that we only ever lock a subset of the table at a time. Uh, you can also configure the uh, delay between, um, between each backfill batch. So if you want to avoid overwhelming a downstream read replica on the other side of the world, for example, uh, you can configure the delay between each batch so that replicas can, can keep up, basically, yeah. Hi, uh, a really good talk, thanks. Um, I also had a similar question, but I also had another question. Uh, so in the example you showed at least, the uh, versioning, uh, this versioning of database is really tightly coupled with the versioning of the API, I guess. Uh, because the, uh, it was the API version we do, then, um, and it was like back uh, to the, uh, the database version we do. But for example, if you don't have to change the interface from the API perspective, could you still do this? Uh, like from database change, but uh, 
the API wouldn't change. So you would still be V1, but there would be some business logic changing internally, but not like. Yeah, so um, not all migrations need to be expand contract migrations. Um, there are some changes, uh, for, like creating a table, for example, that we just do directly. So you don't need this kind of uh, two phase migration. Um, for the majority of the interesting cases, I think um, expand contract is the right way to do it. But yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't apply to all migrations. And some migrations, you can even just write like a raw SQL migration and kind of opt out of the expand contract thing entirely and just use it as you would sort of any other migration tool as well. Hi, Ma Ma Matthias here. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I have a question about the, uh, the maturity about the uh, roll application. It's at 0 0.7 now, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Uh, when can we expect to a version 1.0 that we can use in for production. Is, uh, do you have any, any idea about that? I have seen the list about features that are to be implemented for version 1.0, yes. but. So we have a V1 milestone. Um, I think for us to ship a V1, we, uh, so we use this in production at Zeta. So customer schema migrations use PG roll uh, for, f to do the migration. Um, it's true that we don't have any extremely large customer databases, like terabytes of data. So I think before we can do a V1, we need to test it, battle test it more against very large databases. Um, and um, yeah, so we also need to define, we need uh, more benchmarks to assess the performance. Um, how long does backfill take against these very large tables? What's the effect of the right amplification using triggers? Um, so we need to get some more clarity um, on these kind of issues against very large databases before we're confident shipping a V1. One last question, someone? Okay. Uh, so my question is, uh, as you have uh, as you have demonstrated, to, uh, if I would like to uh, incorporate the PG role into my application, do I need to add some dependency or some other things in my application code to enable that? Uh, yeah, so PG role is a command line tool. Uh, it's also usable as a Go module, so you can call it directly from Go code. Um, the only thing you need to change in your applications is to configure each version of your application so that it knows which version of the schema it needs to talk to. So the point in your CI process, um, CD process, where you set the connection strings for your applications to talk to the database, you will also need a way there to tell it which version of the schema it's supposed to talk to. So that can either be done directly in the connection string, depending on what library you're using, or it would have to be in the application itself to set the search path immediately after connection. So we have examples in the documentation of, of how to do this, how to configure applications, yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.